Welcome, and in this session, we're going to be reading from Matthew chapter 16. We're going to be talking about how a certain group of people came to Jesus and demanded to, sh to show them a sign. We're going to be talking about the yeast of the Pharisees, what that means, how Jesus responded, what Jesus means by that. We're going to be talking about how Jesus asked his disciples, whom do you say that I am? And, and we're, going to, we're going to be talking about who responded, and we're going to be talking about all that. And also, Jesus foretold his own death. Let's get right into this. This is a very important uh, passage of Scripture. Lots of meat here. So pull up to the table and get ready to be served. Verse 1. The Pharisees and Sadducees came. The Pharisees and the Sadducees came. These are two different groups of people who believe different things. They teamed up. Okay, They got unified. And they tested Yeshua. They tested Jesus. Again, if you're, if you're going to be living godly, if you're going to be a real true Christian, they tested Jesus. They're going to be testing you. Okay? Different ways maybe they're testing you. So they tested him and asked him, that's Jesus, to show them a sign from heaven. Now, Jesus could have been nice here and said, okay, yeah, I'll, I'll do you a sign. Or he could have been really nice and said, oh, I'm sorry. I'm not going to, not, not right now. No, no, it's not the right time. I, I apologize. But this is what Jesus said. And he, it says in verse 2, But he answered them, When it is evening, you say, It will be fair weather, for the sky is red. In the morning, it will be foul weather today, for the sky is red and threatening. Hypocrites! You know how to discern the, the appearance of the sky, but you can't discern the signs of the times. An evil and adulterous generation seeks after a sign. And there will be no sign given to it except the sign of the prophet Jonah. Wow. Whew. That's that's a hot answer. I mean, he again, Jesus didn't miss a beat there and nailing it. Just, just nailing it. Just boom. There, I mean, that's, I mean, called them evil. Called them hypocrites. Said, you know how to discern the, the you know, the, the weather, which isn't all that you know, great, but you don't have that great discernment, but you, you know how to discern the weather, but you can't discern the signs of the times. You can't even discern where you are spiritually. Evil and adulterous generation you are. So it says in um, the last half of verse four, he left them and departed. The disciples came to the other side and, and had forgotten to take bread. Jesus said to them, Take heed and beware of the yeast of the Pharisees and Sadducees. Take heed and beware of the yeast of the Pharisees and Sadducees. Now, just to, again, just to back up just, just a step here. We, um, we talked just in the previous point about the sign of the prophet Jonah. Um, I think it's just expedient that I go uh, and, and just briefly cover this for those of you who have never heard this before. Um, Jesus talks about this uh, several times uh, throughout the Gospels. The sign of the prophet Jonah is when Jesus re um, identifies himself to be like Jonah. As Jonah was th spent three days in the heart of the fish and then was uh, more or less resurrected uh, after three days and spit out of the fish, so the Son of Man, or speaking of Jesus himself, will be three days in the heart of the earth in the grave and will come out resurrected. So I felt like I just had to back up there and, and deal with that first. So that's the only sign that the evil and adulterous generation will get. So the disciples, again, let's uh, go over this one more time very quickly. The disciples came to him on the other side uh, and had forgotten to take bread. Jesus said to that, Jesus said to them, take heed and beware of the yeast of the Pharisees and Sadducees. Okay? So, I mean, it's kind of... Jesus, in the context that Jesus said this, obviously they're going to be thinking about physical bread because they forgot to take bread. And so, oh man, you know, I'm out of, we're out of bread here. And Jesus said, well, be, you know, take heed. Beware. Be careful of the yeast of the Pharisees and Sadducees. 
and be like, hmm, I mean, we're all talking, we all need bread here, and you're talking about the yeast of the Pharisees and Sadducees. So obviously, verse 7, it says, they reasoned among themselves, saying, we brought no bread. What are you talking about, yeast? Right? Uh, verse six, uh, 8, excuse me. Jesus, perceiving it, said, why do you reason among yourselves, you of little faith? We just talked in the previous session, uh, the previous chapter, about how Jesus called the Canaanite woman, you know, who is not even Jewish in or origin, great faith. And same with, you know, we talked about the Roman centurion as well. Great faith. But his own disciples, how many times did he say great faith to them? Right here, why do you reason among yourselves, you of little faith? Because you have brought, because you have brought no bread? Do you yet, do you, don't you yet perceive? Don't you understand yet? Neither remember the five loaves for the, uh, for the 5,000 or how many baskets you took out, nor the seven loaves for the, for the 4,000 and how many baskets you took up? In other words, don't you know I'm not talking about like physical bread? Like I'm not talking about that kind of stuff. Don't you understand I have the power to just make bread? If I need it, uh, you think I'm talking about bread? You think I'm worried about that? He continues. Jesus says, the words in red, the words of our Lord says, how is it that you don't perceive? You don't understand that, I'm, that I didn't speak to you concerning bread. But beware of the yeast of the Pharisees and Sadducees. So he repeated himself. Beware of the yeast of the Pharisees and Sadducees. Yada, yada, yada. He's talking about, we don't have no bread. We didn't bring no bread. What's he talking about? This yeast. Uh, we don't have any yeast anyway. Huh? He's like, don't you understand? What, what, what do you think? I can make bread. I'm not talking about that kind of bread. I'm talking about the bread of the yeast. And the ye I'm talking about the yeast of the Pharisees and Sadducees. Verse 12. Then they understood. So they understood that he didn't tell them to beware of the yeast of bread, but of the teaching of the Pharisees and Sadducees. Now, let me stop there because I have to tell you, I have to tell you something else here. Because in the same book, the book of Matthew, in chapter 23, Jesus is also talking about the teaching of the Pharisees. Okay, he didn't say much about the teaching of the Sadducees there, but he talked about the teaching of the Pharisees. So it's important to understand here, in verse 12, it says they understood. It doesn't say that that is exactly what he meant, but that's what the disciples understood, that it was the teaching of the Pharisees and Sadducees. Now, I will tell you something to clarify something. That is not exactly what he was talking about. That's what, the, that's what they understood. That's what the disciples understood. But Jesus made it clear that the teaching of the Pharisees is something that they should listen to. Okay. Go to Matthew chapter 23, verse 1. We're going to be reading verse 1, 2, and 3. Matthew 23, verse 1. Then Jesus spoke to the multitudes and to his disciples, saying, The scribes and the Pharisees sat on Moses' seat. In other words, they, they represent Moses. They're, they got the Moses hat on, more or less, okay? In our terminology today they they you should you should respect them as you respect Moses you should listen you should listen to them as you listen to Moses listen to this verse 2 saying the scribes and the Pharisees sat on Moses seat all things therefore whatsoever they tell you to, to observe their teachings what they tell you to do observe and do but don't do their works, for they say and don't do. Okay? Let's make this clear here. Jesus was saying to, the, to his disciples and the multitudes, he included everybody here, he said, the scribes and the Pharisees sit on Moses' seat. Respect them, honor them, obey them. He said, all things, not, uh, not something, oh, just, just obey the moral law. Not the ceremonial. Uh, where do you get that? You don't divide, you don't cut up the word of God like that. All things, therefore, all things. And I know some of you might say, well, it says, Paul said to Timothy, you know, rightly dividing the word of truth. 
rightly dividing, it comes from a Greek word which just means to cut straight. Okay? It's not talking about dividing at all. It's talking about, basically, in, in modern day language, Paul was, was encouraging Timothy, which was a younger man in the faith. When you preach, shoot straight, brother. Shoot straight and tell the truth. And that's what he said. Rightly divide the word of truth. Shoot straight and tell the truth. If you look at it, again, if you look it up in the original uh, manuscripts, the original uh, Greek, this is what it means. Shoot straight. Tell it like it is. Not, not take a machete and start cutting up the Bible. Not take a machete and start cutting up the word of God. That's not what he means. God forbid. All of the word of God is still in a, all of the word of God. God doesn't change anything because God doesn't change. If he had to change something, that means that he made a mistake. Or that he, that he changes with time. He doesn't change with time. It's very clear in the, in the book of James. God does not change with time. In him there is no shadow of turning, which means shadow of turning is the, t the shadow of the sundial. He doesn't change with time. He's the same yesterday, today, forever. He's the same from the before the, uh, the foundation of the world to after the end of the world. He's the same. Why? Because he knows it all. He sees it all. He has no reason to change. The word of God is forever, it says, settled in heaven. In verse, uh, excuse me, in Psalm 119. Forever settled in heaven. It doesn't say, well, the word of yesterday was in heaven temporarily until Messiah came and then scrap it. And then, no, he didn't say that. <laughs> he said forever settled in heaven. Okay, verse 3, Jesus speaking of the teaching of the Pharisees. Because they sit on Moses' seat. you got to realize, Jesus and Moses were like this, okay? They were one, okay? Moses said, when Jesus comes, when the prophet comes, he will be like me, like me. The true Jesus is like Moses. When Moses came down on the mountain of transfiguration, he's like, oh, he didn't say, oh, Jesus, nice to meet you. I heard, you know, oh, wow. It's, uh, no, they knew each other from the beginning. They knew each other from ages ago. Everything that Moses wrote was about Jesus. Even Jesus said that. Moses knew Jesus from long ago. Moses was a Christian. Verse 3. All things, therefore, whatsoever they, the Pharisees, tell you to, to observe, observe and do. Okay? Now, again, you got to make it, you got to understand. The Sadducees were only focused on the Torah, whereas the Pharisees were included the Torah and also the surrounding culture, the Jewish culture, the Jewish, you know, he, they adopted the other Jewish traditions, okay? So obviously in context, Jesus doesn't want you to obey all of the Jewish traditions because some of them are against the commandment of God. We dealt with that in the previous session, okay? But he didn't say, Jesus didn't say, all things, whatever the Sadducees tell you to do, observe and do, because the Sadducees are just focused only on the Torah. The Pharisees, on the other hand, are focused on the Torah and others, like the prophets, the writings, and then some, and then some okay? That was their observations, and that was their practice. So, taken in context, understand, please do understand, Jesus promoted the teaching and the practice, and not the practices, but the teaching and the observance, the way they taught. Whatever they tell you to observe, observe and do. But don't do their works, for they say and don't do. So they're hypocrites. They tell you don't steal, don't steal, don't steal, but they, at the same time, they got their hand in, in your pocket over here, stealing. They're hypocrites. They, they, they present themselves like sinners, I mean, by like righteous saints, but they're real sinners, okay? So Jesus said, don't do what they do because they sin, but do what they say because what they say is righteous, okay? So let's keep that in the context. So back again to Matthew chapter 16, verse, verse 12. Then they, the disciples at that time, understood that, that he didn't tell them to beware of the yeast of bread, but of the teaching of the, the Pharisees and Sadducees. Now, 
let's just expound upon this just a little bit more before I go on. Yeast is a leavening agent. It makes things look bigger and heavier than they really are. If you take a, a basically a ball of, of dough with yeast in it and put it in the oven, you know, and bake it, it'll come out and it'll be big, right? But it'd be fluffy. It'd be light, lighter. But if you take a ball of dough that has no yeast in it and you put it in the oven and you cook it and you bring it back out, it'll be super heavy. It'll be super, super heavy. Okay? So yeast makes things look bigger and better and heavier than, they, than it really is. Yeast is symbolic of pride. That's what it is. So when Jesus was talking about the yeast of the Pharisees and Sadducees, he was just talking about the pride that they have. The pride that led them to hypocrisy because, you know, led them to sin, therefore they're hypocrites. The pride, which was the yeast, the things that puff them up. As it says in the scriptures, pride puffs up, but, but real, real true love builds up. Okay? Not puffs up like pride, but builds up. So, the truth of the matter is the yeast that Jesus was talking about was the pride of the Pharisees and Sadducees, the, the way they operate, the way they think, their arrogance, their pride, okay? Wasn't talking about their teaching, although that's what it says that that's what the disciples understood it to be. Now, let's go on. Verse 13. Now, when Jesus came into the parts of Caesarea Philippi, he asked his disciples, saying, who do men say that I am? Or who do men say that I, the Son of Man, am? Okay, so there's a big clue right there. Because the term Son of Man, Ben Adam in the Hebrew, Son of Adam is what it means, which is Seed of Adam, which is specifically referring to the Messiah. Okay, I mean, you know, he, he, who do men say that I, the Christ, am? <laughs> Basically, that's what he was saying, more or less, okay? Uh, who do men say that I, the Messiah, am? You, you see, it. Messiah is uh, synonymous with Christ, which is synonymous with the Hebrew Mashiach. It all means the same thing. Christ is just a Greek, a transliter English transliterated word from the, from the Greek, Christos, which is a word that means Mashiach, Messiah, okay? It all means the same thing, okay? Who do men say that I, the Christ, am, okay? So verse 14, I mean, he came again, it's kind of, I have to, I have to smile here because Jesus gave him a huge clue. Who do men say that I, the Messiah, am, <laughs> okay? Um, verse 14, they, say, they said, some say, John the baptizer, some Elijah, some others, Jeremiah, and one of the prophets, Verse 15, he said to them, But who do you say that I am? Verse 16, again, it seems to be so, this is just, just so typical of the 12. Peter's always the one just to jump in there. He was always the one that just, he was right on the ball. He was just, boom, he was the first one. First one to the tomb, first one to, to walk on the water, first one to, uh, to, to speak up, I believe it was in the, the Mount of Transfiguration, first one to speak up here, you are the Mashiach, the son of the living God. Jesus answered him and said, blessed are you, Simon Bar-Jonah. So Bar here means son of, Jonah, Yonah, Simon, Simon, Bar Yona, uh, Simon, son of Yona, son of Jonah, for flesh and blood has not revealed this to you. You didn't get this from your own natural thinking, your own natural mind. But my Father who is in heaven, I also tell you that you are Peter, Kepha, Petra. Peter, uh, Peter's name Petrus in Greek is, is the word for a specific rock or stone, it says here in the, in the notes. And on this rock, Greek Petra, a rock, mass, or bedrock, I will build my assembly, and the gates of hell, gates of Hades, hell, will not prevail against it. Now let me stop right there. Now Jesus said, I will build my church upon this rock. Okay, The rock of the revelation of who Jesus is, the rock of, the, the rock of God choosing you. Okay, God chooses people. You don't choose yourself to understand this. You can't understand it with your own human mortal mind. You can't understand immortal things. 
So upon this rock of ele- uh, election, this rock of revelation, uh, I will build my assembly. Does this mean that Jesus started his church here? No. Some people believe that the church was started in the book of Acts. No. The word assembly here in church and many other uh, translations is the is the Greek word um, ekklesia, which means those who are called out, those who are set apart, those who basically who belong to God. It's the same word that that Stephen uses in Acts chapter seven, with uh, in referring to the children of Israel in the Mo, in the wilderness with Moses. He called it the assembly or the church in the wilderness with Moses. Okay, so the church didn't begin with Jesus. Jesus just built it up. Okay, I just mentioned earlier the scripture that said that uh, pride puffs up, but love builds up. It doesn't mean that love creates something that's not. If love is building you up, it doesn't mean that love actually created. Like if I say, okay, it's my love that is building you up right now, it doesn't mean that my love actually creates you. It just means that my love is building what's already there. It's it's strengthening. It's it's uh, exhorting. It's it's adding. It's it's just clarifying. You know, blessing, building you up. So this is what Jesus meant when he said. Uh, I will build my church. I will build it up. I will strengthen it. I will, I, will, uh, I will tend to it. I will feed it. That's what he was talking about. Because we know the church existed, according to the book of Acts, um, in, the, in the wilderness with Moses, way back in the book of Exodus. And I would dare say that the church began in the book of Genesis, in the first few chapters of the book of Genesis. But that's another whole uh, subject to get into. Verse 19, Jesus continues saying, I will give you the key, the keys of the kingdom of heaven. Whatever you bind on earth will have been bound in heaven. And whatever you release on earth will have been released in heaven. So basically, what you see in heaven that's released, you should release it here on earth. What you see in heaven that's restricted, restrict it here on earth. Okay, That's the mission of, of the true church. We like to be free and release uh, things, but we don't like to restrict people from sinning, don't, don't we? These are the ear-tickling, feel-good pastors that just like to get up there on, you know, and just teach, say nice little sermons so that everybody can say, oh, that was a great sermon, pastor. How vain, how vain, how vain, how vain. Verse 20. Then he commanded the disciples that they should tell no one that he was Yeshua HaMashiach. Jesus the Christ. Again, he's not, he didn't look for fame here. He didn't look for recognition. He didn't look for like how so many preachers and pastors and ministers do today. Look what, look the, the position I have in the kingdom of, look how great of a man of God I am. Look what God is doing in my ministry. Come to my meetings. No, not at all. He commanded the disciples not to tell anybody. No, don't tell anybody. Shh. I'm not a show off. I'm not here for fame. I'm here to bless you. Verse 21. From that time, Jesus began to show his disciples that he must go to Jerusalem Jerusalem, and suffer many things from the elders, chief priests, and scribes and be killed. And on the third day, be raised up. You know, just a side note here. How many times did Jesus speak about this to his disciples and yet his disciples did not understand? Even after the fact, they didn't understand. Verse 22, Peter took him aside and began to rebuke him and said, Far be it from you, Lord. This will, this will never be done to you. You need to understand, being crucified was like the most cruel thing that could ever happen to you. I mean, being stripped completely naked. It wasn't like how you see these crucifixes today. I'm talking about completely naked. Whipped with, cat and, with Roman cat and nine tails. Flesh torn off you. You look like just a beat of, you look like just a piece of beet tender meat. Skin torn off. Bleeding to death. Muscle tissue hanging off of you. It says they plucked his beard off his face. They pulled his beard right off his face. You, wow, that's, that's a bad, I mean, that's a horrible death to, to, uh, to suffer and that publicly. And Jesus is like, I mean, Peter, 
I was like, oh, no, we don't want that to happen to you, Lord. No, far be it from you, that to happen to you, Lord. You're the king of, you're the Lord of heaven. But he turned and he said, get behind me, Satan. Whoa, Jesus turns to, to Peter and says, get behind me, Satan. You are stumbling block to me. Hey, this is the same Peter that just said, you are the Christ, the son of the living God. You're the Messiah. And then he said, you know, one little thing and Jesus and this is what so many again so many churches when it you know come Good Friday oh they're sad that Jesus this is the day that Jesus was crucified let's let's have a moment of silence for Jesus let's feel sorry for the cross you know no that's satanic don't do that rejoice it says it pleased the Lord to bruise him in in Isaiah chapter fifty three it, it, God was was blessed by the sufferings of Mashiach. Because of his love and his, he saw that this is what pleases him. You know, death to the flesh, death to the to self, self-sacrifice. This is what pleased him that would bring true and whole and lasting repentance upon the multitudes. So that everybody can look at him and say, I am crucified with Christ. Nevertheless, I live, yet not I, but Christ lives in me. In the life I now live, I live by the faith of the Son of God who loved me and gave himself for me. It is a blessed thing. Rejoice that, that Jesus went through this stuff for you. Rejoice. Rejoice. It is a bad thing. It is an evil thing to go, oh, no, far be it from, oh, what a poor, a poor Jesus. No, this is what Peter did. Get behind me, Satan, for you are a stumbling block for me, to me. For you are not setting your mind on the things of God, but the things of men. You don't understand the mind of God here. You don't understand the ways of God here. Then Jesus said to his disciples, if anyone desires to come after me, again, this is something you don't hear preached in church. I, I'm telling you, if you do, um, well, it's very rare, but uh, many churches probably have never heard this ever read for a long time. And if it's read, the pre preacher doesn't say nothing about it anyway. Verse 24, then Jesus said to his disciples, if anyone, if anyone desires to come after me, let him say the sinner's prayer and come to church every day and in there. No, no, <clears throat> excuse me. I, I had a, a little bit of a problem here in this thinking about modern day Christianity. Let's get into the real deal here. Jesus said, if anyone desires to come after me, let him deny himself. Take up his method, take up his instrument of execution. Take up his cross and follow me. Look forward to your death. Look forward to denying yourself. Look forward to saying no to your lust. No to your desires. No to your will. No to your way. No to everything you want in life. For whoever desires to save his life will lose it. And whoever lose, will lose his life for my sake will find it. For what will it profit a man if he gains the whole world? You can be richer than the richest man on earth right now. What, what, what profit will it be if, if you gain the whole world and, and, you, and you forfeit your own life? You lose your own life. You lose your soul in hell. Or what will, it, what will a man give in exchange for his life? What will a man give in, give in exchange for salvation? For the Son of Man will come in the glory of his Father with his angels, and then he will render to everyone according to his grace and faith and saying the sinner's prayer. No, I'm sorry. Again, I must be just relapsing. I mean, this must be something. This must be just modern day Christianity. I mean, let's, no, say no to that. Jesus said the Son of Man will come in, his, in, in the glory of his Father with his angels and he will render to everyone, everyone, according to his deeds. We're going to get to Matthew chapter 25 where he says, he says about, he talks about everybody that's going to heaven. He talks about everybody that's going to hell and how it's going to be on the day of judgment according to their deeds. Yes, I said deeds. Yep, that's exactly what I said. Verse 28, because that's what the scriptures say. Sorry, but that's what, the, that's what the scriptures say. Let's take the words in red first over what any of the, anybody else wrote over what, you know. Like I said, Read the words in red first. Read, read the book of John and the books of John after that because he was the closest to Jesus. He would have the most, the greatest 
you know, uh, most accurate information, then read Peter and James, the books of Peter and James. Okay. Then after that, read the other books. Then after you've gotten, you, you read all of the writings of the 12 disciples, then read Paul. Okay. Do what, do what the, the, the men of Berea did in Acts chapter 17. If what Paul said is really lines up with Scripture, which was what Scripture did they have back then? Only so-called Old Testament back then. If what Paul said lines up with the Torah, then we'll accept it. If it doesn't, we won't. That's what, more or less, that's what it, mean. that's what it means. They searched the Scriptures. That would be the Torah, possibly even the, the prophets of the Old Testament, so-called Old Testament, and the Ketavim to see whether or not what Paul said was actually lining up with the truth. So do you likewise. Verse 28, Most certainly I tell you, there are some standing here who will in no way taste of death until they see the Son of Man coming in His kingdom. Let me tell you, I'm not going to go into exactly what this verse means in this, in this teaching, but I will in the next. So, as you go, God bless you as you go and think, meditate upon His words, and may God give you um, the ability to remember what we spoke about today. Remember what you read. Remember the words in red. Remember what it means. Be blessed. And God expand your understanding and illuminate your heart and give you great revelation above all your peers. Thank you for watching. God bless.